Hello, hello, hello. We are the Sonoma Community Center podcast, a place of creativity, connection, and community. This podcast is to highlight the artists, the teachers in the community that come through the doors behind these historic brick walls and talk a little bit about what is happening now and taking place in the future. My name is Molly Spencer. I am your host and Gerardo Diaz. And we are the engagement team of the Sonoma Community Center. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's been a couple of weeks. If you have not already heard, we have released the first podcast. We're on to our second. And I, feel, I feel terrible for people who are listening to this. Oh, <laughs> no, it's all good. We've had good feedback and we, absolutely we welcome your feedback. But Gerardo, how has it been the past couple of weeks? We had uh, a big event. I know. We just had Dia uh, last week, which it was Perfect. We had over like 200 people, I believe. Yeah. Dia de Muertos. Dia de Muertos. We do a big, well, we had an ofrenda here, but we also have a big altar, which is really a sculpture yeah, that's yeah, been up yeah. for quite yeah, some who, time. Yeah, did that. It was perfect, though. I loved it. it Jim was beautiful Callahan too. is a local sculptor, and he oh, did that nice, about 10 nice. years ago. So we really invite the community, as well as many notables, kind of like a history lesson walking through there. Yeah. But the public is also welcome to bring pictures oh, as yeah. well. Oh, yeah. So. It was beautiful. Oh, it was gorgeous. And I really want to thank Lexi's. She yes. She's a big part of this. Lexi so. Picard is yes. our youth coordinator. And I got to tell you, that's the most people I've ever seen at yeah, that. Me too. <laughs> and the tamales were awesome. Oaxacan tamales <laughs> made by Yet Series. Grandmother. Yeah, grandmother. I think? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They were delicious. What was it? Like mole? Mole. I think chicken. Chicken Pollo. mole or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. So we had about 150 of those, and I think they sold out by, it was sold out. Everything oh, was free, free, should I say? Yeah. yeah. So, of course, they were gone immediately. Then we had, let's activities. talk about we the churros. Too. Oh, churros. Sonoma churro line. Let's talk about how long Delicious. that line was for two hours. <laughs> yeah, they're famous. They're well known in Sonoma, too. So, and shout out for Janet. She's what, the owner. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. What I teach. Her kids, right? Oh, yeah, what? Yeah, the leg. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, what a beautiful family. They brought me like some hand soap, and then they said that they made over 700 churros. Yeah, they did. They just did. on that event alone. Yeah, I had a hookup, though. I was in the back all the time. I'm like, I hey, know you are. Give me, give me some churros. She's like, how many do you want? I'm like, one of each. You know? Everybody gets a churro, but Gerardo gets a churro every time somebody else gets yeah, a churro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see somebody with a churro, I want to get a churro. <laughs> Even though I just finished eating my churro. So. What I thought, of course, which was amazing. And probably this is often why so many people come is, is the beautiful dancers, Ballet Hispanico. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Shout out for Victor. Thank you, man. Yes. They did a wonderful job. All the dancers. I mean, just it was just beautiful. gorgeous. I think I, I think it was amazing. And like you said, this is my first time doing it too. And I saw so many people, a lot of people from the community. We got the Latino community yeah. involved too. So it was great. Yes, absolutely. Also, the mariachi band. Oh, yeah. Remember? Oh. <laughs> it's, it's, we're like, wait a minute. So it was started at five and all of a sudden it's 730 it's yeah. getting cold. Oh, yeah. it's and they just keep on playing, I think, they until like 8 or 8.30. <laughs> it, almost, it almost felt like I was watching the, the band from the Titanic. You know, yeah. they didn't want to leave, you <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, you guys want to stay? He's like, I don't know. We're what cleaning we up, yeah. putting tables in, and they're still playing. They're still I love playing. that. Yeah, it was pretty cool. That's um, a good band. Yeah, and then we had, I think it was Megan from our ceramic uh, department yes. doing an activity, too. She was doing pitch pots or something. Yeah, and you were doing the famous button maker. The button maker. I'm telling you, after I finished with that, I kind of want to go in and enlist on one of those uh, arm wrestle. You know, <laughs> my arm was so strong that day. I mean, unbelievable, man. I know the ceramics is great. And speaking of ceramics, we're going to get right into it. But for those that are outside of Sonoma and may not know, our ceramics department, Sonoma Ceramics, is bustling and it always has been for years. I think it's the best around in the North Bay, but I'm going to let the professional in a second here, <laughs> Reniel, tell you what his thoughts are. It is led by the director, Meg Billingham, and we strive to make it an approachable and supportive studio environment where artists and makers of all skill levels can awaken their practice of ceramics arts. So what that means is we have open studio, we have classes and workshops for all age, teens, little ones, also striving to bring in professional artists. I know we've had visiting artists all over the world. We just had the Portuguese woman that was here. Do you remember her name? 
Mariana Sampal. I'm going to let you step in, Reniel. This is Reniel Del Rosario, and he is our ceramics artist, but I'm going to let him just touch a little bit. She was amazing. Tile making? Yes, her name was Mariana Sampal. And I really liked the workshop. It was the first one that I that I really attended. And it was just so nice to have this kind of uh, thing that you don't see at Sonoma Ceramics, like teaching people those skills and providing the opportunity for them to know how those kinds of things are made, to make these tiles made with cobalt oxide and things like that. That's amazing. I wish I was in that. Of course, I'm still just making snakes. I wish I know <laughs> what you guys are talking about. I'm sitting here going, blah, 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 blah. That's all I hear, man. But you, that sounds really you cool. You know, because when we are out in the community doing our outreach things, I got to tell you, ceramics is the most popular activity with yeah. kids, families, all ages. Here at the studios, it's actually pretty impressive. They have a couple of studios. They have a hand building studio, also a wheel studio. I think it's about 13 wheels. I won't go into the details. A glazed barn, kiln shed with many different kinds of kilns, which Renelle, you might have to break it down. And Pug Alley, that's my favorite, because I didn't even know what Pug Alley was or what takes place back there. It's literally a little alley, right, on the side of the glazed barn? Yeah, it's a little alley, and it's called Pug Alley because that's where we pug clay. So that's where we turn used clay that no one wanted to really put into a firing so we can reuse and recycle it. Yes, yes. I'm not going to lie. Imagine like a bunch of little pugs just back there. <laughs> Does it work? Recycling the clay. Should I bring the milk? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, what we also have, which has been a fantastic program here, is the Ceramic Artisan Residency Program. Um, it is a nationally recognized program that attracts artists from across the country to further develop their craft and enrich our local community. So how that is, it's offered... Six months. It's a six months ceramics residency, right? And usually it's all inclusive. I know there's been potters and sculptors here, and it's really been a starter for some amazing superstar up and coming ceramicists coming through. Right now, I think just to say some from the past, so if you're listening, you are immersed in ceramics. And I got to say, go look these people up on Instagram because they're amazing artists in their own right. And this is just a few that have come through recently. Some of the ceramics artists is Gabe, Gabo Martini was here, I think right before you, Reniel, right? Two before me. Tab. Two before tab you. Oh, Tab. Oh, Tab. Tab, tab, tab Link. We Look miss up. you, Tab. We miss you, Tab. Tab Link, Gabo Martini, Maxwell Mastardo, which I am like just blown away. He was here actually through the whole pandemic, really, or I would say the first year. Wow, amazing. Love his work. And Naomi Clement, who's an amazing potter as well, back in the BC, and our former director of Sonoma Ceramics, Kayla Stein, who is still here. And Kayla just taught a mold-making workshop this, I think, Saturday, right? She was here until yesterday. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah, she's right just down the street. Down. You can come and well, see her work I'm anytime. I'm new here, so my era is tab. Tab t- and <laughs> now today. So. I know. We always get really attached to the artists in residence. And the one we have right now is Reniel Del Rosario. Introduce yourself. What's happening? Hello there. My name is Reniel Del Rosario. I'm a ceramic artist, and I am currently the artist in residence for Sonoma Ceramics. What did that mean? Six months uh, rent free? Yeah, six months rent free. <laughs> that's, you know, not going to lie, that's a really great part of it. You know, six months rent free. You get housing inside the building. Oh, yeah. You, you get to live with the ghost. Oh, yeah. Man, I didn't even know there was a room here until somebody told me, like, no, I live here, man, for six yeah. months. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's a secret. The community center is like two buildings, and there's all kinds of closets and rooms within rooms. And this reminds me of like a, a fancy New York apartment, right? Only it's It kind of has that vibe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Maybe it's a fancy New York. <laughs> I mean, to me, when I think of it, I think of the converted Victorian houses over in Oakland yes. or San Francisco where uh, Ooh, nice. landlords will just convert old houses and sometimes you'll get really weird partitions and stuff like that. <laughs> like my room, uh, my apartment studio thing, whatever, the provided housing here is the old principal's office. Oh, that's right. So he could look down. So there's a back patio behind the community center, pretty large. And I want to say that 
back behind that was the shooting range and then the what? kids that used to bring their horses. <laughs> <laughs> it was I good. swear to God, someone said there was a shooting range early on. That's to go back to the grammar school times, but you know, wow. this building started <laughs> in like 1913, I think. Well, don't quote me on that, historians. Don't ruin me. We'll get back to the old timey Every corner time soon. I hear something new. <laughs> <laughs> this is my first time hearing about the shooting range. Yeah, it was wow. just like where the parking lot is? It could be. It could be or where the, they put their horses. But I will tell you, the gym, eventually when it was like a grammar school, is where our offices in the downstairs ceramics room was before Tom Collins dug it up. Mm. Huh. So it's kind of like, a, I think, a boys' gym nice. there for a little while. Do you hear things like weird things when you're yeah. in here you by yourself? Anything? Like noises? I know the building is old, so, you know. You I probably, mean, that's you, basically yeah. what I think of it. There I, no footsteps in the middle of the night, somebody opening a door, trying to open a door or something? No, I've actually, I'm sort of sad it hasn't gotten more spooky. What? I mean, Sonoma's a very calm town. There's like nothing going on. No! Uh, <laughs> not in like a super bad way. I would think like, that you, you at least hear like La Llorona, you know, ah, where's my kids? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Raniel, getting into you, let's talk about you grew up in the town Vallejo, right? Yes, I grew and up in Vallejo. Vallejo is not that far from Sonoma. Tell us a little bit about what it was like. Were you born there? No, I was born in the Philippines. I was born in uh, Iba Zambales, ah. and me and my family immigrated here early 2000s. And yeah, I just grew up in Vallejo. How old were you when you came? Four to years the old. States. Four years old. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. So, what was it like in the Philippines? Did you go back there often, or? Not really. I mean, I'm trying to go there more often now. The last time I went was like a series of three times when I had this grant from the uh, Center for Craft and I was using it for research, but also being like, you know, let me use this time to go visit family and all that stuff. And now it feels like something that I want to just keep on doing since, you know, this is my family and they are a few thousand miles across the pond, but it's nice to visit. Was it just you, your parents, and do you have any siblings? No. Well, both oh, my, both my parents have a large amount of siblings. Okay, uh, I'm pretty okay. sure. Yeah, okay. and uh, because of that, I have a bunch of cousins, and yes. a bunch of those cousins, it's usually maxed out. Like we have, it's like one or two children per family because they learn that having more than like seven on each side is sort of excessive. Expensive, yeah. yeah. <laughs> expensive. It's I got three and expensive. It's different here. But in the you States. know, my grandma yeah. did have like, I think it was like, fourteen. Yeah. So yeah. back in the both, days, both my parents had seven siblings each yeah. right and then there's four of us and now we've dialed down to like you i have one yeah. <laughs> yeah. but i started late and cousins are the best no yeah i have a it's, matching sometimes tattoo it's with better cousins. right the yeah. brothers and sisters because they're i don't know something special about cousins mm-hmm. love it so you went to uc berkeley right i did uh-huh give us a little background yeah i went to berkeley i went to a small high school uh, i was a graduating class of like 54 people so when I was the only one that got into Berkeley there was like this big pressure everyone's like go to Berkeley go to Berkeley so honestly I was just going in sort of like blind I was in high school I didn't do any research on like what schools really offered I was just like apply I applied to like nine schools and everyone was like oh Berkeley wow and I was like I guess I'm going to Berkeley (laughs) <laughs> and then when I went to Berkeley, I was supposed to do uh, landscape architecture. I was like looking at the programs and all that stuff, and I was taking classes. And then I knew I wanted to do an art minor, and I didn't want to lose any time, so I had to take a studio class to just for lower division requirements. And because I always drew as a kid, I always thought it was going to be drawing or painting or something like that. But all those classes were full. And I was just like, okay, painting's full, drawing's full, printmaking's full, like everything two-dimensional is full. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll try ceramics. And it was a big mistake because now my entire life revolves around it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got a question for you, uh, Darnell. How was your parents like? Were they really supportive of you when you decided to go on ceramics? Oh, I love my parents to death, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like, no. Especially as like an immigrant family coming in, there's this high thing about uh especially going to the stem field especially like medicine or something like that engineering and so i forget what weekend it was but i came home one weekend i was like i'm going to art instead and you know my parents were cold my (laughs) my family even my aunts and uncles they're They're just like like, looking at you yeah it's like looking at like how are you gonna make money what are you gonna do with that is that that a hobby yeah (laughs) pretty much yeah and then did they know what was coming yeah, and then, you know, everything changes when you get, oh, you get one show, and then they're like, oh, that's good, whatever. And then you get more shows, and then you get 
big awards that then you get into museums and then the support goes from like zero to like, oh, wow, you can actually do this. Yeah, I think I saw your parents the first day you came in and looked at your, you were checking it out, right? Mm. Were they just parents? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they were nice. Parents. Yeah, everyone's supportive now, but it's just so fun. When I think After back, you're making that money? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. If they see the greenbacks, it's like, it's a lot. It, it really eases their concern, which I understand where they're coming from. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Brinielle, you're a spring chicken around here, right? So you're in your 20s? Am I yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, I awesome. wish I'd be 20. Oh, man. Uh, yes and no. No. no, <laughs> well, no. Um, so, how did you end up here? I know. Uh, this or- goes back to Berkeley. And so, I graduated, and I was still going to use the studio because I was living in Berkeley, Oakland area at the time. And so, I was still using their studios, the technician there, and my mentor, Aaron Tool. Shout out to Aaron. I was just using the studio, and one day, he pulls out a flyer, and he's like, this seems like something you should be doing. It was like a postcard for Sonoma Ceramics. But what year was that? Probably like 2019. Okay. Pre-COVID. Yeah, pre-COVID. Well, and, it, you know, it is something that I wanted to do because Berkeley is a very conceptual art program, okay. even down to the ceramics. And so I never got to learn anything technical, like to learn how to fire a kill and how ceramics works and things like that. So... Aaron was very like reluctant to do it, and so I had to bug him a lot of times <laughs> for, that, for me to learn that. He knows I want to learn more and more, and so I think that's why he tried to egg me onto this program. And that's really a big reason why I came here, to learn a lot more technical things and that kind of jazz. Yeah, speaking of that, so I talked a little bit about our kilns, handling all, what it, electric kiln, gas kiln. We have a really big kiln. What is that, the gas kiln? Yeah, the gas there? kiln. And then the special Soda kiln. Fire. Yeah, soda kiln. So I guess that's like, is that the only one in the area around here? I think there's a few folks that have their own. I think ours is the only public one. Okay. Like community one. Yeah, yeah. I actually thought it was a pizza oven when I walked in there. <laughs> I'm like, that's a pizza oven? That's huge. I want to put some stuff in there. I wish it was a pizza oven. Well, <laughs> I mean, there is a pizza oven. Now. No, yeah, 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 yeah. We have a pizza oven. But when I first started, I walked garden. in, I'm like, you can fit like... A bunch of pizzas in here. That's Gerardo <laughs> and his always thinking about food. I was food. thinking about food. Sorry, guys. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> There's this one ceramic artist, June Kaneko, and uh, yes. every time his class finishes, they finish the semester or a quarter, whatever they teach in that segment, they fire a pizza in their kiln. Oh, no and way. So, Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I, I saw a video of it and... What, is it like done in one minute or something? I mean, no. <laughs> that thing is super hot, I'm no, pretty sure. I don't know. I don't know how they essentially know when it's, it's like done. like the ultimate broiler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jun Kaneko is just the local museum, the Sonoma Museum, actually. They just had public art, the mm-hmm. heads of Jun Kaneko that was here a little while ago. Did you, you check about, that out? Are you talking about the heads that were in the square? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. same artist, right? Yeah. Yeah, pretty amazing. Okay, let's get into your work and your style, because I got a lot to ask you. Let's talk about some of the work that you've exhibited and the stores and spaces you've created. Mm. Let's go there. Yeah. So essentially for my practice, I make fake things, fake versions of real things out of ceramic and glaze. And something that I really like to do is I like to make fake establishments, so fake stores like Mm -hmm. delicatessens, art supply stores, gift shops, and I make all the objects ceramic. And, yeah. Has has that fooled a couple people, I believe, right? Tell me that story. Did you have a set-up stand, and there was something about a dad and his son coming to buy donuts? Yeah, so this was what I was doing. (laughs) Fake donuts? (laughs) Yeah, it was when I was doing this project called uh, Rainey's Delicatessen slash The American Dream. And I think it, I was doing it in Davis. Mm-hmm. And I had this fake stand set up where I'm selling ceramic food for the actual price of the food that it represents in the area. And this dad was coming in and trying to buy a cookie for his son. And I usually just go with the flow and I'm like, okay, like I'm just going to sell these to people. But the moment I heard that, the son was super <laughs> excited to like eat the cookie and the dad was like, we can wait till we get home. And I was like, okay, like, no. I have to break performance and like tell them like, hey, 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 this is ceramic. Yes. So you're basically meshing, I mean, not only the practice of ceramics and, but performance art as well. When you were growing up, uh-huh. did you have a lively imagination? Did you play, you know, 
fake store, fake school, write plays, do any performing of that nature? Yeah, no, like not. a little kitchen or something? No. You know? oh. It was like drawing and like making comic books and stuff like that. Okay, okay, okay. I know it surprises me because I actually did this. That's why I get so excited about your art. Mm. So you, you might have like a part, really good imagination though to yeah. become an artist. So mm, No, yeah, I was definitely just like doodling and drawing and stuff like that. But I never made any like fake store or anything like that. Wow. Okay, that's funny. I did that. I was an active house. We made house. We had our own forts. Mm. You know, so that's a big part of it. And I just wondered because you're basically you're living my dream, Renielle. I was gonna say I'm living a lot of like childhood. <laughs> you're, li- people's you're, you're living a lot of people's childhood dreams nice. if you created those environments when you were young. Mm. Tell us a little bit about some of the past exhibits too in SF MoMA, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Meta Commission, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So for SF MoMA, they invited me to, to be a part of their uh, artist soapbox derby, which they haven't done since <laughs> the '70s. And so basically, what it is is that they invite local Bay Area artists to make a working gravity-powered vehicle yes. to go down McLaren Park's hill. And so I was invited for the first one since 78, and I made an ice cream truck because they wanted to have, you know, a car that represents your practice in a bit. And I said, I want to make a store on wheels, and it was either going to be a burrito truck or an ice cream truck. Oh, burritos. But I felt like, as much as I love burrito trucks, and I go to them more often than ice cream trucks, <laughs> yeah. I feel like you can make a bigger variety of sillier things with an ice cream truck. Well, visually, yeah. it's like a pink and white. I don't even know how you created that, but visually, oh, I don't it's know either. stunning. <laughs> pink and white, right? And you even dress the part. And offered your ice cream services. So this was in front of the museum? No, this was going down uh, McLaren Park. Okay, okay. And then after that, my car was exhibited in the SF MoMA. Wow. Yeah. When was that? That was, oh my God, now we're getting the dates. That's where my (laughs) head is foggy. He was like 10 years old or something. (laughs) (laughs) I I want to say from April until end of May. Okay, okay, yeah. end of May. And then prior to that, what really drew me in is you talked a little bit about what you did down at Meta, mm-hmm. Facebook, whatever. Tell us about that project, because it's quite funny, actually. Yeah, so uh, I was offered the Meta Open Arts residency, which is called residency. It's not really a residency. It's sort of like they ask you if you want to make art for one of Meta's spaces. And for Meta... Uh, I can't disclose the location because of NDAs. Of course, meta. 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 It's just meta. Yeah. They're just meta. out there. I installed about 120 ceramic security cameras in this <laughs> one stairwell. <laughs> <laughs> but they're n- are they real? Well, the funny yeah. thing is in, in the stairwell, there's one real camera. So among this giant <laughs> amassment of 120 just in this. Just sm- one works. Yeah, just yeah. The one's a real <laughs> camera. Oh, my God. That is Awesome. And then you shifted also during COVID. Haven't you had a few online stores? Yeah. So when COVID started, I was really getting into the kind of store projects. And with COVID happening, you can't go out in public, have stands and that kind of stuff, or like be in galleries and change spaces because everything was closed. And I was sort of getting sick of it. I was like, I want to do something. And I thought the closest thing to a store at the moment in like March, April 2020 was to go on eBay and, like, put up ceramic versions of things I would look at growing up, like Jesus on Toast yes. or uh, Cheeto-shaped-like things. Like it was, what? Did you do that? No, but... As, <laughs> as a kid, this was, like, the thing. Like, if you were bored, you would go on eBay, and they used to have a section of, like, just oddities, and you would find, like, cursed dolls along with Cheeto-shaped-like things, and it was just, like, this weird, bizarre list to go through and be like wow or like wow well not only did you make the objects you also do the packaging which i find quite impressive yeah so for a lot like the gift shop store projects stuff too yeah i make so it's usually like a i don't know how to describe it. it's like a dollar store chachi where you have like a plastic toy in a bag and then it has that yeah. paper label <laughs> so i basically make the object in ceramic then i put it in a plastic bag and i go on photoshop and make every single label individually and then I print them all out, cut them all by hand, staple them, hole punch them all individually and I make <laughs> He goes all the way. Yeah, I mean yes. I feel like I sort of have to or else I feel like it's Right. Not. If you don't, you know, then you're like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I get it. So that kind of leads us in what you're doing here. Coming up this weekend on November 12th is the opening of 
Rinyell's show, Urban Legends. And we'll go back and tell you guys, what is it? Start at 6 o'clock, right? Starts at 6 mm-hmm. o'clock, goes until 8 p.m., and there is a performance at yeah. 7 p.m. Let's talk about what fake establishment you were presenting to us right here at the community center. Yes, I am making a fake museum called the Museum of Found Objects, shortened into MOFO. Yes, the opening of MOFO mm-hmm. this weekend. <laughs> yes, and Perfect. it'll feature ceramic bootlegs of things I found in museum collections online, old catalogs and books, pop culture, social media, and like sometimes just like random kitschy things like found on the side of the street. And so it's this really big like mishmashing of all these high and low and value and undervalued type of stuff. I know. I love the absurdity of it, but you also have pretty deep social commentary kind of mm. around your whole show, right? No, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, that's you know. it with all the store projects, too. Yeah. It's like, it is a fun thing, but when you get down to, like, the whole concept of it, it's a pretty messed up thing. <laughs> right, right. That's just a consumer society and mm. just, I love it. It's like a big, you know. Yeah, I have to admit it. look. <laughs> every time I used to walk by uh, Raniel's studio, I'm like, what are you doing? He's like explaining, I'm doing this and that. I'm like, oh, that looks cool, man, you know? So I think I bother him a lot, but... That's just you don't me. bother me enough. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good to know. What I thought was really cool too here in your residency is everyone that comes here that is a resident usually teaches a class in their style and their technique or whatever. But you challenge the students and build big, fast. I have to say it like that, right? <laughs> Workshop that you did a couple of weeks ago. What was that all about? That was about showing folks how to build big fast. It's a pretty (laughs) self-explanatory thing. But why would you say that some people limit themselves? Do they just get tripped up in their own mind and you just say, let that go? Well, it's sort of like that, but it's also, I think for me, it was really nice because Sonoma Ceramics is very pottery centered. Yeah. Like probably 90% of things going in and out, probably 95 if I'm being honest, are functional pottery and it was nice to be here as an artist in residence and people looking at me, making sculptures, bring them in and out of the kiln shed, see me working in the studio. And they're like, oh, that's neat. That's cool. And especially considering the way I work, I'm a terrible ceramic artist, by the way. Like in terms <laughs> of technical skill, I do so many things that people cringe at, like not covering <laughs> things at all or like not slipping and scoring, making things solid. Like a lot of things that people are like, what the hell? <laughs> but, uh, and that's basically what the class was. I was teaching them how to build big fast in my way where I could make fairly large sculptures in a short amount of time. Yeah, so it was just fun, especially to see, to actually just be blown away by what the students were making because they exceeded my expectations by a oh, cool. lot. Like people were building big fast and they were using the techniques I was showing them and they're making cool stuff. Do you have a technique? Build big fast. <laughs> I wish um, I can take one of those classes, man. I, I'm, I mean, I'm terrible at building things too. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you. I mean, I can. I, I want to always want to build like a nice size bowl so I can eat my pozole. It just doesn't <laughs> come out that way. Mm. It just comes out flat. I don't know how to make that round. You know, mm. I need to take a class, man, for sure. Yeah, the ceramics is awesome. Back to the show, Urban Legend. So it's up till December 9th, but this Saturday it will be the opening night. And you have a performance part of it, and you're collaborating, which I'm super excited about. Mm-hmm. My little dance background, but mm-hmm. not anymore. Dance performance collab. Who are you yes. collabing with? With my friends Emma Lanier and Kaveri Suresh. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, they'll be dancing with some ceramic objects. I'm not going to reveal a lot because I want it to sort of be a very surprising thing for folks. Are they from the Bay Area? Yeah, San Francisco. Okay. Yeah, I was checking out their bios. They they come a lot from like safe space. There's great modern dance and contemporary dance places that really support that, you know, Mm -hmm. performance dance in San Francisco. So it's such a joy to have them up here. I'm definitely calling all my my dance theater friends. Are we having food? Yes, there will be food. (laughs) Edible food? (laughs) Yes, there will be edible food. No fake, right? No fake. All right, sweet. So this is exciting. Something that is going to happen in the Museum of Bound Objects, MOFO, is tell us a little bit about what will be happening. Like, if you can't make it to opening night, you're up till December 9th. You can come and visit the museum during open hours, which is usually every day until about 7 o'clock, I think, is when they kind of close down that. What's going to be happening in there if you're up there and looking around at everything? 
Uh, well, it's actually pretty nice because if you can't make it to opening night, what the museum is committing to do is uh, <laughs> a new piece will be acquired or a new or a piece already in their collection will be modified due to new discoveries every single day until the exhibition's closing. No way. So opening night, there'll be a performance, but closing night, you'll have the most objects. So really you have every day you have to come to see the differences. Hey, did you ever hear about either of you? Did you ever know about like found magazine? Found like a zine? Magazine. Yeah. And they find mm-hmm. all kinds of letters. Look it up. Found it. It gets started out as like a zine. And then, um, you go on the website, but you'll check out where they've submitted letters or people find things. It's very intriguing. Mm. So what is next, Raniel? When you leave us over here in Sonoma, we will miss you as always. You'll have to come and visit. But what's next on the horizon? Uh, I have a fairly busy year next year. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm going to have a solo show at Praise Shadows in Boston. Wow. Uh, next year in December, and nice. then I'm part of a museum show at Scripps College down in Southern California, and then I'll have a show at, I think it's Space 10 Gallery in Portland, Maine. Great. And I'm doing a project with Yank Sing in San Francisco, a very popular dim sum place. So I'm sort of excited oh. for a small break in between the residency and all that stuff. Oh. You see, Dad? Hmm? Oh. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we're excited about it. And anybody that wants to catch and follow Raniel's career that can't make it out here for the show, please, is it the best way to follow you on Instagram? Or what's your preferred method of figuring out what Raniel is doing in 2023? Uh, probably Instagram or my website. If you search up Raniel Del Rosario, R-E-N-I-E-L Del Rosario, you should be able to find it. It's a smiley face icon for the yep. profile image for Instagram. And then if you search up my name on Google, too, you'll find my website. <laughs> Both of which need to get updated really badly. <laughs> well, you're busy. Yeah, you're busy you got creating. Time, man. I mean, what's next? Museum? I think we should have Tofo, the town of found objects. The Is town. it town on the future horizon, right? Just all. Mm. Yes. Well, for the museum show down in Southern California, I'm making a bodega. A bodega. It's going to be as close to real scale as possible. There was an office depot closing down in San Francisco <laughs> and they were selling all their metal shelving. So I went and bought a bunch of metal shelvings just so you had that like busted up metal shelving with like the canned food and like things in jars and things like oh, that. That's so amazing right sounds there. Sounds like we need to take a community mm-hmm. center field trip next year yeah, yeah. down south. Okay, well, your show's coming up, Urban Legends, everyone. Come and join us. This Saturday opening, you can RSVP at Sonoma Community Center dot org. But I'm going to leave you with Gerardo's question that he likes to ask everyone. OK, so if somebody gives you an elephant, uh-huh. OK, yeah, you can give it away. You can sell it. What will you do with it? Have a pet elephant. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know like where else I'm supposed to go with it. Uh, I've seen your apartment, dude. It won't fit in there. You know? <laughs> we'll have to find some kind of arrangement. I, don't, well, I mean, <laughs> what am I going to do? I thought I would use it as transpo. I think I said that. But... I don't know. Maybe they can pull the metal shelving down south. <laughs> Start after the show. You'll be there soon. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I said I killed it and then I eat it. So it was terrible. I was terrible. That's a very different. <laughs> Gerardo is our culinary guy. I know. I'm uh-huh. sorry, guys. Speaking of that, so he always does a segment called What's for Lunch. Yeah, what's what for lunch? You, what's for what's lunch? For lunch? What's for lunch today? I know. I don't know. You said pozole. Now I'm crazy. Well, you know, it is actually a really good day for Pozzoli because it's a, kind of like a rainy, cloudy day, you know? Where's yeah. the best spot in town? I would say, you know, there's a lot of spots, actually. Uh, there's a Grand Taco, but I think it's closed. But we can definitely go and try La, um, La Hacienda. Mm. For folks, if you're coming to Sonoma, you heard it first, where to get the best Pozzoli besides Gerardo, right? Yeah, you yeah, make yeah, your yeah. own. My mother-in-law makes a really good. Ooh, you know. and La Hacienda is on Highway 12. Look yes. it up. Highway 12. Yes. So much. I think if there's anything I'm eating a lot nowadays, it's a bunch of burritos and tacos. Oh, <laughs> I've been going don't to El. Get me there. I've been going to El Molino a lot. Mm-hmm. Oh, 
delicious. Yes. But if you guys want to have like really good tacos, uh, Tacos La Costa is by Highway 12. They're delicious, man. I just had them yesterday. And they're uh, uh, um, they're just a pop up, really. Yeah, they just started. Is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they're at the local farmers market every Friday. And if you get tacos, trying to get the consomme is the little broth where they the beer, yeah, the, yeah, the, the beef, you know, and they give you a little broth and then you just eat tacos and then take a sip of the broth. Oh. Beef broth. It's that will delicious. bring you back. Bring you back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Raniel, thank you. Thank, thank you. I'm so you excited Rinelle. you're here. And I think we're going to kind of wrap it up here, talk about what's coming up um, at the community center, well as talk about what we're going to do on the next show. But what we have, if you are in Sonoma or you're coming to visit Sonoma in November and December, we have a bunch of holiday workshops, especially for the fam. As, of course, we covered in the first program that every class and workshop is sliding scale. That means we're there to meet any financial barriers. So making snowscapes and mixed media, clay candle holders, wow. wreath making, holiday card making, and embroidered snow globes. That's just a few that are, you know, centered towards Christmas. Not holiday related and totally cool workshops that are coming up pretty shortly are jelly plate printmaking. This is cool. Kelly Autumn is our printmaker. I took this class during COVID because it's a gel. What is that stuff? The gel, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> making your own sound effect. <laughs> anyway, you bake it. It's oh gosh. Anyway, what I'm saying is you can reuse this stuff. This is a sustainable <laughs> class, right? So jelly printmaking. I think we'll have to have Kelly on to yeah, sort yeah, of explain yeah. that a little <laughs> bit, but you can reuse it. Oh, oh nice. man. I really dug into that one. <laughs> Also on the scene, the culinary department has a really cool workshop, vegan gumbo and Ooh, cocktail vegan. for the holidays. And one that's coming up pretty shortly here actually is I want to talk about cooking with medicinal mushrooms for health during the holiday season. Oh, that's uh, November 17, I believe, right? Yes, yes. And this is in partnership with the Botanical Bus and the Sonoma Community Health Clinic. And Gerardo, please do me a favor because this is definitely a bilingual class, right? It is. I just heard about it, too. I think it's a bilingual class, and I think it's called the uh, Ongos Medicinales para la Salud Estacional. So I think we got Lulu also doing a class every other Tuesday. Okay. She's okay. from the Botanical Bus, too. So she worked for them. And do you know about the Botanical Bus? Because I just found I out about it. it. And yeah, I'm, I just I'm find out excited. about you. I know, I know Lulu works for him, but uh, don't know a lot about it. Yeah, yeah. They're in partnership with the Community Health Clinic, and they're really there to kind of support natural... I should know more about this because my family is, is it, all about is it natural the ways to really community health clinic. Is, yeah. is it the one that they always call here and be like, hey, um, I need to make a, an appointment to see the doctor? Don't we get calls from them? <laughs> okay, so yeah, rounding this out. So we're at the Sonoma Community Center, right? The local health clinic is Sonoma Valley Community Health Clinic. Everybody's got to throw in the word community, right? <laughs> As if nobody knows, right? <laughs> and we have definitely gotten a lot of calls for them. One pretty funny time was literally a woman called in and started to explain these medical symptoms, pretty private <laughs> symptoms she was having. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold it right there. We're actually the Sonoma Community Center, you know, take an art class, that sort of thing. Oh, she was so embarrassed, but yeah, we regularly <laughs> get calls from them quite a bit. Well, Just get ready. So next time, episode three, we're going to deep dive, speaking of culinary, and Alisa Hota, Gonzalez Sohota is our culinary director, and she can tell us more about the botanical bus and yes. the partnerships. And this is really Gerardo's area, oh, too. Yeah. I don't know. I think it would be great having her in. Um, she's been doing a lot of programs for the community, too, so which yeah. I'm really happy. So, And you're she, part of that as well? Yeah, yeah. You know, she dragged me in. You know, I couldn't say no to Elise. She's <laughs> such a nice person, you know. So. Every time Hiroto makes lunch, ceviche, oh, oh my yeah. God. Don't miss out on those days. Delicious. Mm -hmm. I, I won't be making ceviche now because it's the winter. You know, winter's not really. It's on, uh, That's all day, right? Yeah, yeah. It's almost uh, when it's, like, hot. You want a ceviche. You know? Mm, I know, now we go pozole, tamales. You know, that's yes. that's like a bear now. I just bought tamales from the oh, local did? lady that comes around mm, the neighborhood. Yeah, delicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So we'll deep dive into the culinary world, and we're going to have Josh Cutler on, yes. our director of operations. Yeah, that, 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 that's my like my my friend there. You know, I turn around, <laughs> I was like, "What's for lunch, Josh?" Every time. And Josh has already has like he has in his in his mind already what he wants. Yeah. You know, he's like. You know, I want the burrito because in this place they crispy the tortilla and then they have the rice and then he likes black beans by the way on his burrito. So mm, uh, every time I get my burrito, it's like black beans, please, no sour cream. <laughs> you know? What place is the place that does the crispy tortilla? Oh, he, he just asks. He's like, he's always oh. like, oh, I want you know. Well, actually, me. The only place that I don't like to get uh, what's it called a burrito is I won't mention the name, but. <laughs> What is but, they here steam, we go. but they steam burritos. Oh, no, no, it's no. like, who steams no. a burrito? It's like, are you steaming a tamal? No, no. It's no, a burrito. No. You got to throw that tortilla on some butter. I okay? remember the first time I, I remember the first time I, I went to this place. And I'm like, all right, I want a burrito, you know, la, la, la. And they're like, all right, got it. And then I'm like, well, there's no flat iron here. Where are they going to cook my tortillas? And then they just wrap everything up. And then they put it in a steamer. I'm like, what is that? Is that like hot? It's like, no, this is a steamer. I'm like, what? <laughs> that thing out of there that is gonna be soggy man you know nobody wants a soggy burrito you know i know it was terrible so i'm excited (laughs) and so josh cutler will be on they'll talk i'm sure about a little lunch lisa will talk about all the culinary programs and we'll also share with everyone at the end of november the sonoma community center has always done a free thanksgiving dinner for in partnership with Rotary and Vintage House. In the past couple of years, it's been a drive through because of COVID, but we are back at the Vets building. This is a free community event, volunteer led, and Josh is really leads us up. So oh, he so can we, talk a little bit more about it. We do need a lot of uh, volunteers, so. Um, we get quite yeah, a few. Get- you know, we're in partnership with Rotary, so we have quite a few, but I will tell you, whenever you're running a volunteer thing, Who's cleaning up? So if you're ready to come and help us clean up, we would so appreciate it. That's the cleanup part, man. Yeah. Everybody likes to eat and cook. Oh, and yeah. then the cleaning part is like, mm, yeah. I'm full. I want to go. Yeah, I want to go home. <laughs> Pretty much. Especially that meal. Yeah, Pretty, yeah, yeah. Because it's like carbon coma. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I like the next day, though. I can have that um, cranberry with the turkey, you know, like a sandwich. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, I can't wait. Turkey a la king. Come on, Gordon. Papu. Come on, Gordon. Anyway, you can tell we are hungry. It's actually, we're coming about lunchtime right now, and we're going to sign off. But if you are enjoying the Sonoma Community Center podcast, please subscribe. Listen to the first one. I think my headphones are falling off my head, so it's telling me it's time to go. Okay? <laughs> this is Molly Spencer. Gerardo Diaz. And? Reneldo Rosario. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Take care.